Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is for the first, uh, I'm sorry, the second quarter. This is the months of April, May, and June of 2016. And it's on the book of Matthew. And this is lesson number two in that series for April 9 of 2016. This lesson is entitled, The Ministry Begins. I think you'll find it very interesting as as we have already. Let's, I hope you have your Bible handy, but we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, it's a great privilege to gather with friends and talk about your word. Help us to think through things clearly, to represent the truth about you clearly, and may those who are listening in Receive a blessing as we have, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So how did the ministry begin? Well, of course, we know about John the Baptist. We know about the early times of Jesus. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, Of course, Jesus' ministry was certainly not the beginning of his life. Uh, He had already spent some 30 years living in Nazareth and so forth. But he had an existence before that, as we know. Um, so our, que- our, our, our lesson study starts out by asking, how does the life and death of Jesus answer the most important questions in the universe? And what would those most important questions be? We know about the existential questions. Where did we come from? Why are we here? How do we get the best good out of life? And where do we go after we die? And I am very happy to say that the scriptures, and of course I would add the writings of Ellen White, help us very well in understanding the answers to those questions. The story of redemption and the great controversy behind it give us the full answers, I believe, to those questions. We're blessed by those answers. So, how did this all start out? Look at Matthew 3, and of course, prior to that we had the, the um, baptism and that business, but looking at Matthew 3, starting with verse 1, at that time John the Baptist came to the desert of Judea and started preaching. Now, where is the desert of Judea? South of Jerusalem. Well, yes, yeah, south and in east of right. Jerusalem. Turn away from your sins, he said, because the kingdom of heaven is near. John was the man the prophet Isaiah was talking about when he said, and who's, who's saying that John was the man who's, who's making that prediction, that, that statement? Think that came from Jesus or did that come from Matthew? The statement, of course, is someone is shouting in the desert, prepare a road for the Lord, make a straight path for him to travel. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He wore a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. People came to him from Jerusalem, from the whole province of Judea, and from all the country near the river Jordan. They confessed their sins, and he baptized them in the Jordan. Does that sound like a good way to begin the ministry? Can you ask the question, where did uh, this, how did this quotation from Isaiah get applied to Jesus. Yeah, or to John. Yeah, Both. John, to John. I suspect that Jesus made that statement to his disciples and Matthew is just recording it for us. Yeah. I don't think Matthew is the one that came up with this new idea. I, w- I would like you to try to imagine now, maybe close your eyes for a moment, and, and imagine yourself going down, let's say, from Jerusalem or even from Galilee. And you hear that there's this guy out there in the desert preaching and you go out there and he's this rough looking guy wearing very rough sort of clothes he's got a funny leather belt around his middle and he's preaching this stuff telling everybody to turn from their sins how do you think you would respond to that well, it must have caught their attention because when you read a little further along in the same chapter, everybody from all walks of life, including the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were all out there checking him out. Mm-hmm. How did he get their attention? 
Any idea? Part of it was by speaking the truth. Yeah. What a dreadful thought. <laughs> yeah, okay. And he said... Are we, are we sure that this is, this is really out of the ordinary? Weren't there other people that did that same thing? Well, there, were, there have been at other times people who have started, hopefully, started something. But they always fizzle very quickly. And, well, and either that, they get arrested by the authorities or whatever. John was a... Who, what group of people did he hang out with? Well, you're talking about the speculation, or are you talking about what we know for sure? Well, I thought, uh, how much speculation is it? <laughs> well, he, 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 his ministry was down near the northern end of the Sea of, Ga uh, sea of the Dead Sea. Later, he moved on the other side of that D Jordan River, probably to put, for his own protection. But you're thinking of the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls that had very, very strict the Essenes, I presume. Is that what you're thinking about? Yeah. So the, the, his connection with them is pretty speculative? Well, there's certainly nothing in the Bible about it. Uh, the only reason people, people think that there's a connection is because they were very close there, and some of the things he said sounded a little bit like some of the things they said. So people some of the things that they said. Mm -hmm. so, some of the um, things they wrote. They wrote. Some of the things they wrote. Well, you could probably get the idea that they were pretty outspoken people, probably, to be by themselves and keep track of the Bible like they did and whatever. So, well, let's look at, let's, let's take it this very blunt sort of approach. John's message said, repent, get baptized, right? Just in the very few words, that's repent. Does that still apply to someone who's been an Adventist all their life, like me? I mean, I was baptized what decades does it mean ago. To repent. Change but, but directions. It means yeah, change your mind. That's, change that's your, exactly metanoia. I do that every day. Yeah. So what do I do? I just when, when I when I admit to myself that this is the right way, wrong way. Well, then I. Say it to myself and... Stop persisting in that, go in that direction. Yeah, I, I used to think I should go this way, now I'm going this way. Mm -hmm. So I'm repenting for going this way, mm -hmm. so I can go this way now. Mm -hmm. So he was telling people to repent, to go a different well, way. Well, in, in his case, it was more like people are going this way, and he said you need to go that way. Well, Pretty much called, different than what they were doing. He, he called the priest a, a brood of vipers, so yeah. he obviously had them sized up. Did that, um, did that attract everybody else when he called them brood of vipers? Well, it sounds like he was just reminding them of something maybe they already knew, if he was telling them all to repent, yeah. because people would have to know that they were doing something wrong in order to do that. Well, one of the things that is interesting about him, and we're going to talk about this in terms of Jesus and others later, he did a lot of quotations from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. If you're a prophet, do you need to quote the Old Testament? Well, it would be nice to mix it in a little bit with everything <laughs> else you say. Why, why would that be nice? Well, you can show connection. Mm -hmm. Okay. I and mean, you're not coming out from left field with no connection. You wonder who this person is. Well, Let's, let's think about things that people do sometimes to, to gain authority. How about performing miracles? Did John perform any miracles as far as we know? I don't think so. Not that we know about. He seemed to know the, the right person to point on out. The, on the other hand, we really don't know much about his educational background. He may well have had access to some scrolls somewhere. Oh, yeah. Probably. <coughs> Um, remember, his father was a priest. Yeah. <clears throat> but by contrast, now let's move over to Jesus for a moment. Almost as soon as he called his disciples, when this is into his ministry of ways, by up in Galilee there, he sent them out, and what did he tell them? Look at Matthew 10, verse 8. Heal the sick, bring the dead back to life, heal those who suffer from dreaded skin diseases, and drive out demons. You have received without paying, go so, so give without being paid. 
Do we have any evidence that the disciples went out and started raising people from the dead? We don't have any evidence at that time. Oh. Later, yes. Yes, we do. Do you we, think they actually went out and did that? Maybe he I was, mean, if God told you to do it, what would you do? Well, they didn't know he was God, but then it wasn't until later, until after they saw him for okay, a while. Okay, but they saw him doing it, and then he said, I want you to go do it. Well, you said, you made it sound like as soon as they, he found them, he well, told them after. to go do that. After. I mean, well, I wonder if... This is, the, this is right after he... I mean, this, the scripture, we don't know exactly the exact timing, I mean, every single detail of there, but very soon on the scripture, very soon after he named the twelve, he sent them out. And well, that was before we have recorded that Jesus raised anyone from the dead, isn't it? I believe so. Well, I, I've seen some teachers do that kind of thing. Go do this, go do that, and go do, do this other thing. And students scratch your head and say, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. And then they go ahead and they start, the teacher starts showing them how to do it. Mm -hmm. So it could have been something like that, too. Well, we've already mentioned this, but let me just look at Matthew 3, starting with verse 7. When, the John, when John saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to him to be baptized, he said to them, You snakes, who told you that you could escape from the punishment of God, God, the punishment God is about to send? Do those things that will show that you have turned from your sins. And don't think you can escape punishment by, by saying that Abraham is your ancestor. Now, how would that work? I tell you that God can take these stones and make descendants for Abraham. The axe is ready to cut down the trees at the roots. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water to show, you that, you, show that you have been repented. But the one who, co who will come after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He is much greater than I am, and I am not good enough even to carry his sandals. He has his winnowing shovel with him to thresh out all the grain. He will gather his wheat into his barn, but he will burn the chaff in a fire that never burns that goes out. And he will baptize you with the Spirit of Truth or the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, that covers it all, doesn't it? What does that mean? What does it mean to baptize somebody with fire? Well, it could mean a lot of things. Seems to me he's describing what happened just before he went back to heaven. Well, okay. Or just after. Yeah. At the, uh, right, at the right. Pentecost. Yeah. Well, yeah. which, which interpretation are you choosing when you say baptism by fire? Well, let, let's, let's, let's think of some examples. In ancient times, one of, the, one of the few ways they had to purify important metals like gold and silver was to heat them very hot, in, in which case the impurities would tend to burn off. So probably a baptism by fire, that's probably what they thought of. You purify it by heating it very hot. So, so you ask somebody to do that? <laughs> well, I mean, why would you? Basically, what John is trying to say is, Jesus is going to is coming to purify you. Yeah. And what what would that process be? How does he do it? What what doesn't he? Give truth, mm -hmm. and the truth is what convicts you, or you, or you reject it. Yeah, and that's that. Any other way to to do it? He didn't threaten him, didn't uh, use coercion of any form. It's form. interesting that John the Baptist here connects the coming of the Messiah, which was right happening right then, with a judgment that's coming when. But really, they do the, the second coming. But they really do the judging right then. Yeah. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. That's judgment on your, on the part of the individual as to they want to conform or take instruction from the greatest teacher who ever lived, or be self-centered. And the question which I like to ask uh, relative to first coming and second coming: Was there any reason for Jesus to come the first time if he doesn't plan to come back a second time to rescue his friends? No, I mean, it doesn't make any sense anyway. Okay. Do you think that that, 
when you when you transferred your thoughts over to the second coming mm -hmm. and whatever, do you think he was talking about that? Well, what do you think he's talking about? He's talking about winnowing and separating the chaff from the wheat. Yeah, but sometimes that happens in life as you're living. Well, yeah, sure. And, sure. and um, things. That's not the that's not the ultimate winnowing. Well, no, but um, what else would the other would the people think of? You think they have all this second coming background and everything to go back to there to start thinking about I, that? I, I, I'm pretty sure that at that point in time, they thought the events which we connect with now, the second coming, they thought were going to happen at the first coming. Yeah. In fact, there's very good evidence for that. They're just waiting for Jesus to do it. So they didn't, they probably did not understand that there was a second coming. There's just no. this coming that they were looking for at that very time yeah. for a okay. different reason. Move, moving on in our story, look at a couple of verses. Matthew 4, 1. Then the Spirit led Jesus into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Does that sound right to you? Well, now compare if I can find my No, it doesn't. Here. Okay, let's go here. What about Luke 4 1? Same 4 1. Jesus returned from the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the desert where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Is that better? I can, mm, someone can't. edited it better. Yeah. <laughs> you think so? I can't see the Spirit leading him there to be tempted. Okay, do we. Do we do we know what the sequence was? We're not ignorant. Well, if you, if you take the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Truth, he had been educating himself about, uh, had been educated about the truth, and he went out there and was try ultimately, when he was at the end of 40 days, when he was next to death, really vulnerable and the adversary uh, to attempt okay, to take well, advantage of him. So let's, let's back up for a second. Why did Jesus go out for 40 days with no food? I mean, obviously it was intentional. Right. Why, why would he do that? I mean, there, weren't there wild animals out there? How do you know it wasn't going to be eaten by a lion? There were lions in Judah in those days. Yeah. So you think he went out there because he knew he had to be weakened? No, that wasn't the goal. He went well, out regularly. Oh, no. I'm asking you why he went out there. I'm not asking, I'm not trying to imply anything. I want you to tell me. He went out there to fast and get close to his father, communicate yeah. with his father about what the mission for the next three and a half years to was plan going to be. His, to yeah. plan his mission, that's exactly right. And how did the devil play into the story? The devil tried to take advantage of the Took situation it, yes. when he was weak from hunger. Clear at the end of the time, he thought, okay. I kind uh, of think of, of Job, though. In a way, the Holy Spirit led him into his situation well, with the devil. Yeah, the devil did, really. No, but Remember the devil couldn't do it unless God said, said okay. It. That's right, he allowed it. And it that, wouldn't that work for that, that thing, well, passage you just read? Well, God allowed it. Sure, if that's your question. I mean, no, obviously... I'm saying that there's, a, there's kind of a parallel between the two. Oh, well, yeah. Not, not, not arguing with that. No. But let's, let's, let's look at things now from Satan's perspective for a moment. What did he have in mind here? Now, I guess we need to ask one other question. Was this the first time Christ and Satan had really faced off in mortal combat, if we will? Absolutely not. No. Okay. There well, was the war in heaven before the earth was 12. created. Okay. There was in the Garden of Eden. There was quite a conflict. Probably at the flood, there was a conflict. Certainly, mm -hmm. with uh, Abraham, mm -hmm. at, uh, there was conflict with Job, okay. and we go on and on. What, what? Let me just ask a simple question relative to Christ's mission here on this earth. He cast out a lot of devils from people. What do you think happened each time there? Was that a direct... That, so later in his ministry, but was that... Um, 
you can be sure Lucifer was in the background if nowhere else, but I was going to add to it, Christ, I'm sure long before this, went out in the desert on his own. Mm -hmm. He had habits that were established from pretty much childhood. Mm -hmm. the de uh, Satan has been watching his every move, and he's just waiting for a time to get there mm -hmm. at him. Okay, well, um, by the way, what kind of uh, weapons did they use in the, in the war in heaven? Words, ideas. Words and ideas, almost certainly words and ideas. What kind of battles, what kind of weapons do they use uh, out, out there after 40 days in the wilderness? Truth, words, words and ideas. ideas. Well, Christ has fasted for 40 days. He's look, looking weep, emaciated. Satan appears as a bright, shining angel. And what does that make you think of? He, he's trying to make it look like now he's the, the good guy from heaven yeah. and, and Jesus is the bad guy, taking, right? Taking Gabriel's place. Mm -hmm. When Satan and the Son of Man, and I'm quoting from Desire of Ages, page 119, paragraph 2, when Satan and the Son of God first met in conflict, Christ was the commander of the heavenly hosts, and Satan, the leader of revolt in heaven, was cast out. Now their condition is apparently reversed and Satan makes the most of his supposed advantage. So, let's think about this for a moment. What's the basic, is there a basic, basic difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan? Yeah, one's the antithesis of the other. Uh, the okay, other, yes. in what way? Well, from the information we have, God's kingdom is a kingdom of love. Yes. And the other side of the coin is this is straight out every man for himself. Selfishness, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, if you were Satan and you know, I mean, he's intelligent. He can't be just dumb. You know what your, 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 your motivation is. And you're coming to someone that you know whose motivation is diametrically opposed to yours. How do you approach him? At his weakest point. <laughs> and appearing to be something different yes. from what Satan was. Deception. Yeah, deception. Well, just a couple of verses here that are very familiar. Isaiah 14, king of Babylonia. Here, here, here's a, a, a words of scripture talking about Satan back in the beginning. King of Babylonia, bright morning star, you have fallen from heaven. In the past you conquered nations, but now you've been thrown to the ground. You were determined to climb up to heaven, to place your throne above the highest stars. You thought you would sit like a king on that mountain in the north where the gods assemble. You said you would climb to the tops of the clouds and be like the Almighty. But instead, you've been brought down to the deepest part of the world of the dead. Now, that's the Satan side. Now, Philippians 2, 5 to 8 tells you about the Jesus side. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God. So... First of all, we're saying what? This is God's essential nature, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. But he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Is he being selfish here? Yeah. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. Or as, as Phillips puts it, the death of a common criminal. Wow. So I, I, Satan must have struggled with that issue because he, 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 he must have understood what motivated Jesus. And he knew how, what motivated him. He knew what motivated Jesus. So how is he going to tempt Jesus? Tempt him to be more loving? I mean, Satan comes, and, and if you look at these things, Basically, these are temptations to be selfish, right? To, to a person that was totally other-centered, it, it wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Proud, selfish, egotistical. When you come with those kind of approaches to Jesus, and you know the, the, the temptations, uh, you know, well, let's just look at him. Then the Spirit led Jesus into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After spending 40 days and nights without food, Jesus was hungry. Then the devil came to him and said, If you are God's son, 
Order these stones to turn into bread. But Jesus answered, the scripture says, human beings cannot live on bread alone, but need every word that God speaks. Then the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem, the holy city, set him on the highest point of the temple and said to him, if you are God's son, throw yourself down, for the scripture says, God will give orders to his angels about you. They will hold you up with your, their hands so that you're not even your, foot, your feet will be hurt on the stones. Now, why did he want to do that, do you know? There was a legend among the Jews that the Messiah would come and descend from the top of the temple. Mm -hmm. And if Jesus had descended like that and said, here, let me help you conquer the Romans, I mean, there would have been just an all... I mean, there would have been a rush. The whole nation would have been after him, right? Well, then Jesus, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their greatness. All this I will give you, the devil said, if you kneel down and worship me. Now, I don't... It's hard for me to just even, even comprehend Satan saying that to, to, to Jesus. He knew that Jesus was his creator. How, how could you... I, just a personal note about this business of turning a stone into bread. I mean, it's never been a temptation to me because I can't do it. But I couldn't remember one time when I was late in the day climbing out of the bottom of the Grand Canyon. I wished I could turn rocks into bread. <laughs> Lots of rocks and no bread. Uh. Lots of rocks and no bread is right. So... Jesus obviously could have done all the things that, I mean, he had the power to do the things that Satan tempted him to do, right? He could have turned the rocks into bread. He could have jumped off the highest point of the temple. He could have said, yes, you know, I'll take the whole world. He could have done those things, right? Well, since God's kingdom is a kingdom of love, heaven can accept only people who will act lovingly for the rest of eternity, putting others ahead of themselves. Heaven is not a place for us to be served, for us, but for us to serve others with joy and love. Um, what, what's the sort of usual picture of what happens in heaven? Floating on a cloud, playing a harp. Floating on a cloud, <laughs> playing a harp. Yeah. <laughs> and who are we serving or who's serving us as we do that? So what do you think... Could you could you give a, a more realistic picture about what's going to happen in heaven? I think sometimes from our perspective, trying to gauge what's in heaven, what we live here, even the wealthy of us that live here in big mansions, mm -hmm. is really no comparison to what we have in heaven. And yet the Bible says we're going to build houses, we're going to plant vineyards and all that. Well, that's kind of similar but then you look at heaven, nothing deteriorates. Well, but maybe it does here and there. I mean, you can look at it. We really don't know until we get there. But I don't think God's going to let us sit around like schoolboys with nothing to do. No, absolutely not. Well, Satan sought to take advantage of him out there. There's a very interesting statement from, from Ellen White. This is found in a book that some, many people are not aware of called Volume 2 of the Spirit of Prophecy. These were small books that were written by Ellen White back in the 1870s, written primarily for Seventh-day Adventists. <clears throat> and they were so popular among Adventists that she later said, well, no, I need to expand them, and I need to modify them for the general public, and that's what, of course, became the Conflict of the Ages series. But this earlier set uh, is where I'm quoting from. He, that is Jesus, had been separated from his mother for quite a length of time. During this period, he had been baptized by John and had endured the temptations in the wilderness. Rumors had reached Mary concerning her son and his, his sufferings. John, one of the new disciples, had searched for Christ and had found him in his humiliation, emaciated and bearing the marks of great physical and mental stress. Jesus, unwilling that John should witness his humiliation, had gently yet firmly dismissed him from his presence. He wished to be alone 
No human eye must behold his agony, no human heart be called out in sympathy with his distress. The disciple had sought Mary in her home and related to her the incidents of this meeting with Jesus, as well as the event of his baptism when the voice of God was heard in acknowledgement of his son, and the prophet John had pointed to Christ, saying, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. For thirty years this woman had been, been treasuring up evidences that Jesus was the Son of God, the promised Savior of the world. Joseph was dead, and she had no one in whom to confide the cherished thoughts of her heart. She had fluctuated between hope and perplexing doubts, but always feeling more or less of an assurance that her son was, indeed, the promised one. So, now try to imagine yourself in Mary's position. John comes and says, well, you know, Jesus was baptized, and then he disappeared. I went looking for him. And he's out there with, with no food, and he's looking awful. Could, could we draw a conclusion or maybe some ideas? What we have here is relatively short, but if he's out there for 40 days, there must have been a lot went on that we don't know about. Yes. When you and think how do we know about the things that we do know about? There was no one out there to report yeah. these events other than Jesus telling the disciples at a later time. Or the Holy Spirit revealing to some prophet to write it down. I mean, John's eating locusts and honey. Now, there must have been something else in his diet. I can't see you existing yeah. long on that. And oh, well, I, I can tell you, having lived in Africa a number of years, um, they, they, they eat grasshoppers. Oh, they yeah. roast them. No, they, eat, they eat flying ants. They eat other things like this. I mean, that's a delicacy. Yeah, and it's protein, but still. And then when you think what Christ was eating from town to town, mm -hmm house to house here and there. By our standards, it sounds anything but balanced. I see. <laughs> so what else would you find in the desert to eat? Who would know those days? Well, a couple things. We've, we've sort of jumped around this business. I think we need to be very clear about a couple of points. Jesus went out into the wilderness to spend time with his Father and with the Holy Spirit to think about his future ministry. He did not, he did not go out there to be tempted by the devil. That happened. He knew it was going to happen, I'm sure. But he, that wasn't the reason he went out there. What Some people have, a number of people have compared the temptations of Jesus to the temptation of Adam and Eve. What way were they similar? What way were they different? Well, Christ was a human while he was here, and they were, you might say, new models off the assembly line, and they hadn't fallen. Mm -hmm. One or two similarities, but I'm not sure it's exactly the same. Okay, well, it was, in both cases it was a temptation to eat something, right? Yes. Okay. Did Je was Jesus hungry? Did he have a right to be hungry? It was a normal process of living. Yeah. Did, were Adam and Eve starving? No. They could eat from the tree of life anytime they wanted to. And yes. How many other trees? We have no idea in the garden. There was no hunger on their part whatsoever. They still took, the, take, took that fruit. What, else, what other con contrast or comparison can you think of? Well, they were in daily communication with God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Both sides. Well, by his victory, Jesus showed clearly that there is never any excuse for sin. He was tempted, and we are all tempted. But we do not have to fall. Through faith and submission to God's will, we can overcome. Which brings me to think about a verse that James mentions, James 4, verses 7 and 8. So then, submit to God, resist the devil, and by the way, Maybe I should just mention that in, in passing. What happened at the end of that exchange between Jesus and the devil? What was the last part of it? Well, Christ ordered him to get out of his way, and the devil left. Yeah. The angels came and ministered to Christ. It's interesting that Ellen White, one place, comments, 
the devil didn't have any choice. When Jesus said, get out of here, he had to go. So Satan had been asking him, okay, give me some proof that you're really the son of God. Jesus did. <laughs> he did. He said, get lost, and he had to. It's, it's very interesting. Well, he also said to him earlier on, you shouldn't put the Lord, your, your God, to a test. Yeah. It's just not on. Yeah. Well, James 4, 7, and 8 again. So then submit to God, resist the devil, and he will run away from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you hypocrites. Be sorrowful, and so forth, and so forth. Um, how good are we at resisting the devil and making him run from us? Pretty poor. <laughs> Not very good. Well, here's a statement in our, in our Bible study guide, Tuesday, April 5, says this. How does this account, by showing us in such a powerful way that there is no excuse for our sin, make our need for Christ's righteousness so essential? Imagine if we had to stand in our own righteousness without that covering and without justification for our sins. What hope would we have? None. Raise any questions in your mind? What What's that covering it's talking about that's provided by Christ's righteousness? What does it do? Why is it necessary? Is it so the Father cannot see what terrible sinners we really are when we slip into heaven? Is Jesus trying to get us into heaven without the Father really seeing us? I'm not trying to be funny here. I'm trying to, I'm trying to ask some serious questions. Sure there's, surely there's nothing wrong with the Father's vision. So what does it mean to be covered with Christ's righteousness? It, it has to mean being transformed by taking on His character. And that happens by a well-known process. We sometimes... Well, our only hope is in God's promise that by beholding we become changed. 2 Corinthians 3.18 and, of course, Great Controversy 555, paragraph 1. If we are willing to take the time to contemplate the life and death of Jesus and come to understand why He came and what He was trying to teach us, God will work within us to change us to become more like the Jesus we worship and admire. Um, there's a, that process sometimes works the opposite way too, doesn't it? Look at Psalm 115, verse 8. Um, if you read the first part of that, uh, it says, why should the nations ask us, where is your God? Oh, our God is in heaven. He does whatever he wishes. And then it talks about all the foolishness of the gods they worship. And then verse 8 says, may all who made them and who trust in them become like the idols they have made. What does that tell us? To become like the idols they have made. And I, there's Worth, a really... Worthless. The idols are worthless, so they become worthless, yeah. right? Well, look at that. Look at Second Kings. This is what happened in the northern kingdom and why God allowed them to be conquered by the Assyrians. Second Kings uh, 17, verse 15. They worshipped worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They followed the customs of the surrounding nations, disobeying the Lord's command not to imitate them. They became, they worshipped worthless idols and became worthless themselves. So, what, what's going on there? Kind of like Great Controversy 555, we become yeah. like what we worship. Okay. So now if we look at the ministry of Christ in parallel with the experiences of John the Baptist, you will discover that when John was imprisoned, if you follow the sequence along, when John is in prison, what does Jesus do? Goes to Galilee. He moves to Galilee. Things are getting hot in Judea. Jesus has been working sort of under the radar for about a year and a half around, back and forth probably, but spending a lot of time in, in, in Judea. But when they actually arrest John the Baptist, he says, it's probably better for me to move on. He goes to Galilee, and it's at that point where he calls, officially calls his disciples and starts ministering there. About a year later, John was put to death, beheaded. And what did Jesus do? He, moved. he got out of sight. He disappeared for a while. For about six months, he took his disciples out of 
Judean and Galilean territory up to Sire and Ty Tyre and Sidon and over to um, <clears throat> Caesarea Philippi and so forth, way outside of Judean or Jewish territory. And then what did he do for the last six months of his life, of his ministry? Remember? Went to Perea. Most of the time on the other side of the Jordan. Was that Jewish territory? No, it wasn't. No. So when, by, when John was, was beheaded, John the Baptist was beheaded, Jesus basically moved out of Jewish territory. Now, he, he would come back in from time to time briefly and go back again, like raising Lazarus from the dead and so forth. So it's interesting that those two lives are very sort of intertwined as their ministry, in their ministries anyway. Um, during those first year and a half of his ministry, what was Jesus doing? We have already mentioned just briefly a little bit. Do we know where he was working? He mostly worked by himself in, where? in Jerusalem and Judea. Okay. Very good. Um, Desire of Ages talks about that, page 201, paragraph 3. And um, we've already mentioned what happens later. Look at Matthew 4, 13 to 16. Actually, I suppose to, be very, to, be, to, to do this right, we should look at Isaiah 9, 1 and 2 first. There will be no way for them to escape from this time of trouble. The land of the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali was once disgraced, but the future will bring honor to this region, from the Mediterranean eastwards to the land on the other side of the Jordan, and even to Galilee itself, where the foreigners live. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. They lived in a land of shadows, but now light is shining on them. Does those sound, words sound familiar to anybody? Look at Matthew 4, starting with verse 13. He did not stay in Nazareth, he's talking about Jesus, but went to live in Capernaum, a town by Lake Galilee, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Where were Zebulun and Naphtali, where were the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali at this point in time? Disappeared. Scattered by the Assyrians, just spread out through their territories. Iraq, over to Turkey, who knows where they went. So there's no territory. This is the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, but the people, the tribe of Ze Zebulun and Naphtali are gone. But it goes on to say, this was done to make what the prophet Isaiah had said come true, land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road to the sea, on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee, land of the Gentiles, the people who lived in darkness will see a great light. On those who live in the dark land of death, the light will shine. And of course, what was the light it's talking about? Christ. Yeah. Well, there's a famous prophet who came from the, in, in the Old Testament, that came from Galilee. Do, any, do we know any prophets from Galilee in the Old Testament? Jonah. Jonah? Whoa. Okay. And was Jonah a shining light? He converted a whole nation. There you go. <laughs> Not initially. <laughs> but no, he wasn't a shining light. No, he had some problems, didn't he? He, wa he? he apparently knew God pretty well, but he wasn't happy about it. That's incredible. There's another interesting point. The word, the, the village that we know as Capernaum, in the original language is Kafar Naum, which is the village of Nahum. Is this the Nahum that has a book in the Bible named after him that was a prophet, a prophet in the Old Testament? We don't know. But it's called, the, Capernaum is the village of Nahum. So which Nahum, we just don't know. So why do you think, I mean, if you were going to be the Messiah and your, your message is for all the Jewish people, why don't you set up headquarters in Jerusalem? Wouldn't that be the obvious thing to do? They'd have been on him like wolves. <laughs> they were anyway. Yes, right. He wouldn't have had the time that he did have. So he moves to a place where they were regarded as rude and backward and un unenlightened. Is that a good place for the Messiah to go? Must have been teachable. Yeah. Some of them were. 
Well, both Nazareth and Capernaum were in, were in Galilee. Um, look at Matthew 4, going on to verses 17 to 22. From that time, Jesus began to preach his message, Turn away from your sins because the kingdom of heaven is near. Does that sound like any messages we've heard before? Sounds a lot like John the Baptist, the Baptist. doesn't it? It's almost verbatim John the Baptist, isn't it? So, in what way did John prepare the way for Jesus? He wasn't a disciple of Jesus. He didn't travel around with Jesus. Jesus just crossed paths with him apparently a couple of times very briefly. In what way was he a predecessor or lead people to Jesus? You thought about that? He must have had uh, an awakening for people mm -hmm. in a kind way that made them start thinking. Well, I think yeah, that would certainly be appropriate. If you, could, if you get people to start asking questions and thinking, that would certainly be appropriate if the Messiah is on his way, wouldn't it? Well, I think God must have had a hand in it and led him. Oh, sure. Yeah. Part of it was probably starting to prepare some of the disciples yeah. so in why the right say, way so that they could that? then be stolen, quote-unquote, stolen by Jesus from John the Baptist. So what you're saying is that some of the people who later became disciples of Jesus had formerly been disciples of John the Baptist. So that was one way in which he helped to prepare the way for Jesus. He said, here's some young people. Let me get you going. Let me sort of get you educated, thinking along these lines. Someone's coming. There he goes. There's the Lamb of God. Oh, wow, wow. Let's go find out about this guy, right? Well, a lot of people think that Matthew 4, starting with verse 18, is the first time Jesus had met these people. Look at these verses. As Jesus walked along the shore of Lake Galilee, he, said, he saw two brothers who were fishermen, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew catching fish in the lake with a net. Jesus said to them, Come with me and I will teach you to catch people. At once they left their nets and went with him. He went on and saw two other brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were in their boat with their father Zebedee, getting their nets ready. Jesus called them, and at once they left the boat and their father and went with him. Do you think this was the first encounter of the, between these people and Jesus? No. Yeah. What he did was not unknown. Okay. There were others that used to do that too. Okay. But to my first question, Gordon says, no, how do you know that? Well, some of these same people that were his disciples okay were introduced at the baptism, or just at, well, actually at the baptism, Baptist, weren't they? Yeah. They said, this is the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. And they spent some of their time after that actually following Jesus around, even though they hadn't been officially called. So, Jesus is calling these disciples after they already were very familiar with him. There are some who say, with some, a little bit of tenuous evidence that James and John might actually have been cousins of Jesus. You can't prove that from the Bible, but it's a possibility. So they were pretty familiar with Jesus when Jesus called them. And the evidence for what Jesus did in those first year and a half of his ministry would be found in the first five uh, chapters of the Gospel of John. Um, but it's true that during much of that time, Jesus was actually working alone in Galilee. He didn't want to... Why do you suppose he worked for like a year and a half, very quietly. In fact, we know almost nothing about what he did during that time. Why do you suppose he did that? Not sure? There could be all kinds of reasons. Mention one. Well, the reason why nobody knew much about it is because nobody was with him. So mm -hmm. that seems logical. Okay. So, why would he do it by himself? Yeah. Because he was probably doing some new things that um, maybe people would think he was crazy. Well, if Jesus had come out and said, I'm the Messiah, let me start out in downtown Jerusalem, what would have happened? 
Oh, they'd have been right on him, but further out he was sowing seeds for later. Well, that would be kind of stupid to do that. Wouldn't it? Well, I mean, I that's mean, what you got to do. Hold on, you just can't a just tell somebody, "Hey, I'm the Messiah." You have to have some evidence to show everybody. That's and what that they might be what the, he was doing. Okay, that's what they expected the Messiah to do. Just come out and say, "I'm the Messiah." They expected him to show up on a pinnacle of the temple, fall down into onto the courtyard in the temple, and say, "I'm the Messiah. Let's go. Let's wipe out the Romans." That's scriptural. No, but that, that's, we have good evidence that that's what they thought was going to happen. That's what they thought the Messiah was going to do. Well, they thought the Messiah was going to be a, a general also. And a king. And a king, yeah. So, so I mean, if, could people, have done if that. people think that that's what the Messiah is going to do, and you want them to understand that you are the Messiah, wouldn't it be logical to do what they think they're going to do, you're going to do? not crazy I hope no you got to do what's the truth that well not, okay now you're talking, think now you're talking about somebody that's off over there in Galilee hiding himself <laughs> doesn't that seem crazy um, the Pharise well do you do you think he could if he went out and uh, announced himself like that he'd probably have to fight off people He'd probably have to fight off people that were against him and um, whatever. Don't you think that that would kind of distract from his real reason of coming? Well, did he ever announce himself in Jerusalem? Well, well as far as we know, Messiah. not at that time. Yeah, as the Messiah. He did the triumphal entry. Way before that. He talking about he was called before the Sanhedrin. It's recorded in John 8. And what did he say? He actually said it three times to them. I'm just going to read the last time. They said to him, You're not even 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham. I am telling you the truth, Jesus replied. Before Abraham was born, I am. Then they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. Is that... <laughs> Was he trying to say something? <laughs> I mean, give me a break, huh? The problem was the Pharisees and Sadducees had so twisted okay. what the earlier generations here and there knew. They were so in love with themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's all they wanted to keep going. Plus, if anybody turned up, they wanted to get the Romans. You've only got to look at the history down through that period. That was their main goal, get rid of the Romans. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that in the times of Jesus, a rabbi was regarded... What does the word rabbi mean? Do you remember? Teacher. 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 A rabbi was regarded as a very special person. Many people would crowd around a rabbi to hear what he had to say. But it was regarded as a very special privilege to be asked by a rabbi to become a disciple. Many people reading Matthew 4 think that that was the first time that Peter, Andrew, James, and John had any contact with Jesus. And of course, we've already said that in John 1 to 5, they had known Jesus for a long time before that. What kind of people did Jesus choose? Ellen White has a very interesting statement I'm going to read now from Desire of Ages, page 250. It goes like this. Jesus chose unlearned fishermen because they had not been schooled in the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. What's he trying to tell us? They hadn't been infected with the spiritual equivalent of HIV. That's right. Okay. In other words, it's harder to get people to give up their favorite ideas than it is to teach them new ideas. So Jesus had to pick out people who were unlearned. They were men of native ability, and they were humble and teachable, men whom he could educate for his work. In the common walks of life, there is many a man patiently treading the round of daily toil, unconscious that he possesses powers which, if called into action, would raise him to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant faculties. It was such men that Jesus called to be his co-laborers, and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. Wow. Those a, are... few, a few weeks ago, when Dr. Garrity spoke, he told how his major professor at, at Harvard 
when he had a personal conversation with it, explained, yes, but I'd been teaching it this way for so long, yeah. if I were to, if it, he would have lost all of his credibility because he put something in print or in writing early on, and now he has to perpetuate that the rest of his life. Don't rock the boat. Mm -hmm. Well, we've seen briefly in this lesson how important the Old Testament was in support of the Gospel in the New Testament. There's really no separation between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and here's an interesting brief account from our Bible study guide. An evangelist came to town and advertised his meeting by this invitation, come see a man tear a page out of the Bible. That no doubt brought a crowd. He then stood before them, opened his Bible, and to their astonishment, tore out a page. This page, he said, never belonged there. It's the page separating the Old Testament from the New Testament. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> Whatever one might think of his theatrics, the preacher made a good point. These two books are, are really one. So, again, Jesus and John and all the other New Testament people, when they wanted to prove a point, what did they do? Go, what did they do? Referred to back to? Quote from the Old Testament. And it was probably, in many quotations were from the, what we call the, the Septuagint today. And if you go to the Old Testament, you go to the New Testament, and you go especially to the book of Revelation, there are, some people have estimated there are 550 references to the Old Testament just in the book of Revelation. 550 references to the Old Testament. Well, Jesus knew that he was the divine son of God. So why did he bother to quote scripture when dealing with Satan? Why didn't he just say, well, like he did to the Sanhedrin, I'm God. Just listen. This is what I have to say. He's trying to teach his associates, those who followed him, to look to the scripture for the answers rather than authority of a teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Ellen White puts it, and we'll have to conclude with this. The kingdom of God's grace is now being established as day by day hearts that have been full of sin and rebellion yield to the sovereignty of his love. But the full establishment of the kingdom of his glory will not take place until the second coming of Christ to this world. We stand on the verge of that second coming. We need to be carrying this same message to its final conclusion to all around us and say, repent and be baptized just as Jesus and John the Baptist did. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for these revelations of your love, these bits of information about the ministry of John, we know so little about it, and of the early years of Jesus. We thank you for what we do know. Help us to comprehend it and to think about it and gain from it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.